and Susan back Sir, here. I just wanted to say that. Well, we're going to leave it at that. Thanks very much. We'll be back outside Madison Square Garden in a few minutes. And Susan, of course, the floor is empty, but they're here. And lest be, we be accused of not hearing all voices, we cut you off a moment ago. This is Alex Jones from Austin, Texas, a radio talk show host. Yes, sir. With InfoWars.com, both candidates are cousins. They're skull and bones. They're bringing in big government and tyranny. The evidence is clear. The military-industrial complex was intimately involved in 9-11. The commission is a complete fraud. We're losing our freedoms. Both parties are controlled. And if we don't wake up and stand Stand up and speak out, this country is going to be destroyed. Giving up liberty only gives us tyranny. It does not give us security. And I hope that everybody out there wakes up to this and realizes that America is America because we have the Bill of Rights and Constitution. Everybody should investigate 9 11 and find out who's really behind it. It's Bush's and the New World Order's Reichstag. And his cousin Kerry isn't going to save you either. Thank you, PrisonPlanet.com. Alex Jones. There's been an almost total media blackout on the fact that. Most of the 9-11 victims' families are angry at the government and believe that they had prior knowledge or were involved. But they couldn't cover it up when families came to New York from the 9-11 Commission and got in Giuliani's face. So we, we thank you very much for your help, your leadership, and uh, your cooperation. Here's another thing the media continually buries. Giuliani got rid of all the evidence, all the steel from the Twin Towers. He immediately shifted off. Giuliani's a former U.S. prosecutor. He knows a thing about keeping the evidence in a crime scene. And Giuliani suddenly got rid of every piece of evidence. He melted down all the steel and the media didn't report it. That's not interesting. The families had to go testify to Congress to say, FEMA, you've got to stop Giuliani from doing this. They tried to get Congress to stop Giuliani. And Giuliani said, oh, I didn't know anybody wanted me to keep any of the evidence. Uh, well, my simple message is this. Again, Americans, wake up. You know your media lies to you every day. Your government has on record for hundreds of years lying to you every day. That's all I ask. Wake up, pay a little more attention, and don't believe anything you read in the papers. How many times have we caught them lying to us? Yeah, how many? Well, they, they just closed the Office of Disinformation, didn't they? Why, why, is, why isn't that Zogby Poll headline news today? Yeah, why, why isn't that Zogby Poll headline news? It should be. Because every media in the country got it. Zogby sent it out to everyone. What are you going to do when 92% think like us? Well, why isn't the media talking about that? That's a big deal that a majority of New Yorkers believe what we believe in the new major Zogby poll. Why isn't that a major issue? And what is the establishment going to do when everybody thinks like we do? And on Monday, that Zogby poll was released that showed 50% of New York City residents believe the government had foreknowledge and made a conscious decision not to intervene. Fifty percent of the people who live in New York believe that. Well, it's time for a serious investigation. Then CNN conducted its own poll on Anderson Cooper's program 360. After an hour-long show where he and others demonized members of the 9-11 skeptics movement, they conducted their own poll and an amazing 90% of respondents out of over 7,000 believe that there was a U.S. government cover-up. All of the people involved in the cover-up of September 11th have gotten wealthy off of it or gotten even richer. And then now, September 11th is being used to kill our freedoms, to destroy what America is built on, what America is supposed to really be about. Most of my friends have questions about what happened on 9-11, and we'd like to know answers, and we're very disappointed in President Bush's reaction to 9-11. My name is Les. I live here in uh, New York City, and uh, I'm part of a contingent that has, has vigils here at Ground Zero every Saturday. We've been doing it since uh, January, actually. And I've uh, seen a lot of interesting things, heard a lot of interesting things from people. A few just happened today. Uh, a woman came up saying that uh, her family received a phone call from a, a family friend. She was told by this family friend on September 10th, the family friend was a Navy SEAL, uh, told not to show up in Lower Manhattan tomorrow, which was, of course, the 11th. There was going to be a major event. MSNBC investigated the hundreds of reports of individuals in the towers being told not to go to work that day or being told to get out early that morning. And they found out that, yes, it was not an urban legend. 
it was true. They found hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of witnesses. And then the Israeli instant messaging company, Odigo, admitted publicly, told Haaretz, one of the biggest papers in Israel, that yes, they got a warning and instant messaged hundreds of their employees in the towers and told them to leave the building four hours before the planes slammed into it. This is on the record and cannot be ignored. Students pointed up at the towers and told their school teachers in the weeks before 9-11 that those buildings are about to come down. They're about to be destroyed. And then on top of this, we have the public officials being warned. Total evidence of prior knowledge. And while we were in New York, we talked to dozens of eyewitnesses who had been personally warned themselves but were afraid to come public. Some have been told to keep their mouths shut. I was a rescue worker. I will say that I spoke to a, a cop uh, on 9-11 who said that it was going to come down. I don't know how he knew that. He did tell me before uh, it happened, before the fact that it was coming down. The widows from the police department and the fire department were standing at the new school and back the, for the two days. And they were screaming at the media, please pay attention. We got phone calls. We listened that their husbands or their children were saying there's explosives coming on, on like the 23rd, 26th floor before they actually, the buildings went down. And the media started laughing and said, we have no time to hear you. Larry Silverstein originally owned Building 7, and a few months before 9-11, he bought the entire complex, all seven of the buildings, and then he took out a record insurance policy on them. Building 7 and what happened to it is so important because the official story is two jets flew into the buildings, we all agree on that, and that their jet fuel caused the steel to melt and caused them to collapse. But then we look at Building 7, which was the furthest away of any of these buildings from Tower 1 and 2, and it wasn't even damaged, but later that afternoon caught on fire. Now they've rebuilt Building 7. Here's Tower 1 and 2. Obviously, you all know those were hit by jet aircraft. And then we have Building 7, the furthest away from all the other buildings. Building 7 was 47 stories tall. Building 7 was not hit by an aircraft. Building 7 did not catch fire from these buildings. But later in the afternoon, mysteriously, it caught on fire. And then after 4.30 p.m., the firefighters told everybody to get back. They were, quote, going to pull the building, the demolition term, for demolishing one. They told Associated Press reporters, get back, we're going to pull it. And this building that wasn't hit by a plane, that had no damage to it, collapsed symmetrically. Building 7 was a block away where my hand is. But the red flashing square is where Bankers Trust still stands today. It had Tower 1 fall onto it, but just had light damage. The owner, Larry Silverstein, of the entire complex, got on TV and said that they had blown up Building 7. He said they pulled it, demolition. Well, Silverstein owned them all. Oh, Silverstein owned all the buildings. Yeah. How many buildings are gone? All of them. How many is that? That's right. That plane wasn't, I, that, that, I, building, that building wasn't hit by a plane. Nine buildings are gone. Yeah. Thousands of people lost That building. Hundreds more. And, I don't know and there's an official U.S. government plan to carry out the attacks. He imploded that building on himself. He admitted it. He said it on television. He, he brought that building out. Yes. Larry Silverstein. So you understand? Larry, Larry, Larry Silverstein on, on America Rebuilding on PBS said that they blew up Building 7. They blew up 7. Even right. though... Hey, yeah. they, he saw it. Did you see it on PBS? Yeah, he pulled it. He pulled said it. on PBS, he said, we pulled the building. PBS. Oh, yeah, he pulled the building. Pelted by debris when the North Tower collapsed, seven burned until late afternoon, allowing occupants to evacuate to safety. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull, and then we watched the building collapse. Yeah, he said we're going to pull. He said we're going to pull the building. Silverstein he said we're going to we're going to pull the building. And we got the fireman saying they pulled it. I mean, Silverstein goes on PBS and says it, and we're the weirdos when he says it on TV. Unbelievable. Let's see that one more time. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it, uh, and they made that decision to pull, and then we watched the building collapse.
It takes demolition experts weeks to prepare for the destruction of a building. How do they do it on 9-11 in just a few hours? In the tragic days after 9-11, many prominent engineers across the world went public and said, there's no way that fire destroyed any of those buildings. It's never happened to a modern building. Buildings have burned for six, seven days before, and it hasn't happened. The answer was hidden in plain view. Larry Silverstein went on PBS and said that they had pulled the building, demolition term for destroying it. In fact, the local public radio station was told that they were going to demolish Building 7. But since then, the public has been told to be quiet, not to ask questions. And the government hasn't even given us an official story of why Building 7 fell. They say they think fire caused it to fall. And in case you're wondering what pull it means, here's another example where they again use the term pull it to mean control demolition of buildings. Months after 9-11, the remains of 4, 5, and 6 were destroyed. Here's a clip from the same PBS documentary where the head of engineering for the city of New York describes pull it as a controlled demolition. By mid-December, the Department of Design and Construction had leveled World Trade Center buildings for and five. Hello? Oh, we're getting ready to pull building six. We have to be very careful how we demolish building six. We were worried about the building six coming down and then damaging the, uh, the slurry wall, so we wanted that particular building to fall within a certain area. There's a certain excitement in the air about bringing the last structure down at the World Trade Center. Seconds after 7 collapsed, this is what Dan Rather had to say about it. large building in most other cities would be one of the largest buildings in town, probably. Trade Center Building 7 has collapsed. Now, here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse itself. Now we go to videotape the collapse of this building. It's amazing. A amazing, incredible, pick your word. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. Just in case you missed it, here it is again. Deliberately destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. Deliberately destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. This is a photo taken one second into Building 7's collapse. Notice the crimp. If we look at other controlled demolitions, we see that they first blow one of the central columns so the building falls in on itself. If you don't do this, the building falls outward and has a wider collapse radius and can damage surrounding structures. This was not the case with Building 7. Building 7 had a classic crimp or wedge. Its central column was blown out first so it didn't structurally damage buildings just a few feet away from it. Building 7, while I was listening to live feed from our local public radio station later in the afternoon, they talked about Building 7. Building 7 was fine. There was no airplane that hit it. And then they even began to ruminate on the air about demolishing the building. I said, well, I don't know. I mean, well, you can put out fires. You know, why would you talk about demolishing a building that, you know, is good, it wasn't hit by anything? You know, the fires weren't bad or anything like that. What was in Building 7? Well, the Department of Defense, the Central Intelligence Agency, FEMA, U.S. Secret Service, Securities and Exchange Commission, and the city's main command bunker overseeing the entire operation. That's what was in Building 7, a structure that was over-engineered, that could stand thousands and thousands and thousands of degrees of temperature for days if need be. But it collapsed in just a few seconds. Here we are, smack dab, right in the middle of Silverstein Properties. In the next few minutes, we're going to talk about Mr. Silverstein and go over the history of the World Trade Center complex and some very serious questions that need to be answered. You know, it's interesting to note that Larry Silverstein bought this building many, many years ago. This was the only building he bought in the complex. But two months before 9-11, he bought the entire complex 
all seven buildings and took out a record insurance policy on them for over three billion dollars, which he's now been paid. In fact, he tried to get even more. He wanted seven billion dollars on an original two hundred million dollar investment that they made on the entire complex when he leased the whole structure. Mr. Silverstein did quite nicely in his investment. Also, Mr. Silverstein, quote, with a shadowy group of investors, according to the Chicago Tribune, just bought the Sears Tower, one of the next big targets the government's been saying. We hope and pray that nothing ever bad happens, and that's why we're here exposing who may have motives uh, in not stopping further events. The command center for Rudolph Giuliani was in this building. Rudolph Giuliani had his command bunker in this structure, and so did the CIA. It wasn't just the city of New York. The CIA, the FBI were all based in this building. And Rudolph Giuliani told ABC News that he got a call that morning about eight hours before this collapse, before a fire even started, and was told, get out of Building 7. And he left to a FEMA command base that had already been set up the night before, which he's now met in congressional testimony, right down the street by the harbor. A lot of interesting timing. And since 9-11, Giuliani's gone into the terror fighting business, and he's made hundreds of millions of dollars with Giuliani and Associates. Interesting. And then, of course, we have George Bush's uh, youngest brother, Marvin Bush, running security on the complex. And, of course, his contract, by the way, ended on the morning of 9-11. So that's another interesting uh, facet to all of this. None of it adds up. But guess who ran security on these buildings? Marvin Bush, brother of the president, son of the former president, the former CIA director. Marvin Bush ran security for this whole complex. This whole complex, and guess when his two-year contract ended? This is the Associated Press on September 11th. And where did the media pick up on this story? From Barbara Bush's own memoir, Reflections. She wrote about it in the book. Then you have the firefighters telling Associated Press reporters to get back, to get away from the building, that Building 7 was about to come down. And then it magically did come down. And then the University of New York and the U.S. Geological Survey, federal and state, both seismographs picked up explosions going off, the classical pattern of a controlled demolition. He said that they made the decision on the afternoon of 9-11 to go ahead and pull or demolish Building 7 and that they gave the order and watched the building go down. Building 7 is further away from the towers and was not hit by planes. It's further away from the towers than buildings right across the street like the Millennium Hilton and others. So if your building's owned by Larry Silverstein, it collapses because he's got a big fat insurance policy. But if your building's closer and owned by somebody else, it doesn't get damaged at all. Why is the story of Building 7 so important? Why have we spent so much time on it? Because the official story is that the two planes that hit Tower 1 and 2, the big 110-story buildings, caused them to collapse, even though a modern steel building had never collapsed from fire. But then we have Building 7 that was further away than any of the buildings in the complex that later in the afternoon got a few small fires in it and collapsed. Now they have almost rebuilt Building 7 on the exact same spot. And look, buildings right next to it, even though it collapsed on fire, didn't even get that much damage. And then we have this huge building that was right beside Tower 1 and 2 that was hit by giant chunks of the building that did catch on fire, but nothing collapsed. The difference between that building and the new Building 7 is that Larry Silverstein doesn't own that building. Larry Silverstein doesn't own the Millennium Hilton that was closer than Building 7. But every building he owned either caught on fire or mysteriously collapsed. There has been over a hundred uncontrolled fires in skyscrapers in the last 50 years. And never has one collapsed or come close to collapsing from fire. Only earthquakes and demolitions have brought these modern structures down. Then we look at the fires in Building 7, and they would be called moderate by any firefighting manual. But still, the building collapsed. Building 7 had sporadic fires in it for six hours. Other skyscrapers, as we mentioned, have burned for days or even weeks. Why don't they collapse? Because steel doesn't begin to weaken until after 2,000 degrees of temperature. Around 2,500 it becomes red hot and at around 3,000 degrees starts to melt. Another example of this was the Windsor Building in Madrid, Spain in mid-February of 2005. It burned for two days at temperatures much higher 
with white hot flames shooting out of it for hundreds of feet. As we watched the Windsor building burn, I was amazed to watch the media of the world say, well, the World Trade Center towers and Building 7 fell from fire, so it's going to fall. We're just waiting for the collapse. But the collapse never came. All the major support pillars held fast. Steel doesn't melt at that temperature. According to official reports, Building 7 wasn't even in the debris field of Tower 1 and 2. And that's why it's important to look at buildings like Bankers Trust. We already talked about it earlier, but let's focus in on it with some detail. It was right up against the South Tower, only about 45 feet away, and large chunks of the South Tower fell directly in to Bankers Trust. But Bankers Trust is like all other modern steel buildings. It's like the big building in Madrid, Spain. Despite the fact that fires raged through many of its floors and that huge pieces of debris fell on top of it and up against it, it didn't collapse. The architect of the World Trade Center Towers, Nomuru Yamasaki, told the press many times before 9-11 that he specifically designed the towers to take massive passenger jetliner impacts. The construction and project manager for the World Trade Center complex, Frank Demartini, told the press multiple times that they designed the towers not to just take one large jetliner impact, but at least two, and not collapse. And other world-renowned engineers and architects went public as well. But that didn't matter for the mainstream media. They simply ignored their protest. Senior firefighter Lou Caccioli, who survived the collapse of the World Trade Centers, reported that bombs were clearly going off inside the structure. He told People Magazine this the day after 9-11. When we spoke to him, he said he couldn't talk about it. Professor Van Romero, Vice President for Research at New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, told the Albuquerque Journal that the implosions of the towers were too mathematical to be a chance result of airplanes and that only controlled demolitions could have brought the buildings down. Then Kevin Ryan, an executive engineer with Underwriters Laboratories, or UL, that certifies most big buildings in America, went public and said, it's impossible. Jet fuel wouldn't have melted the columns in Tower 1 and 2. This is from the organization that underwrote the towers. Then Firefighter Engineering, the oldest engineering publication in United States history, went public and said, there's no way jet fuel made that happen. And stop hauling away the debris. Stop covering up the crime scene. We've got seven different tapes showing different groups of firefighters saying the towers looked like they were brought down by bombs and they heard explosions. But in the interest of time, here is just one of those clips shot by two French brothers who were making a documentary about New York firefighters on the morning of 9-11. We camped out. It was, it, was, it was much worse than it was when we went up. Yeah. Right? We went up and they had everything set up and came down. It was desolate. It was like, holy shit, I'm on. We came down to the lobby. It was like the first thing was. There was nobody here. What did we do? We made it outside. We made it about a block. We made it at least two blocks and we started running. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if they had detonated. Yeah, yeah, they were planning to yeah. take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. NBC's Pat Dawson is close to the scene of that attack. Pat? Pat, Matt, you uh, if, the, uh, if we are, yes, I can, Matt. Uh, just moments ago, uh, I spoke to the chief of safety for the New York City Fire Department, who was obviously one of the first people here on the scene after those two planes were crashed into the side, we assume, of the World Trade Center towers, which used to be behind me over there. Um, chief Albert Turry told me that he was here just literally 10 or 15 minutes after the events that took place this morning. That is the first crash. He had roughly 10 alarms, roughly 200 men in the building trying to effect rescues of some of those civilians who were in there. Uh, and that basically he received word of the possibility of a secondary device, that is another bomb going off. Uh, he tried to get his men out as quickly as he could, but he said that there was another explosion which took place. And then an hour after the first hit here, with the first crash that took place, he said, 
uh, there was a, another explosion that took place uh, in one of the towers here. Uh, so it, obviously, he, according to his theory, he thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building. The second device he thinks, he speculates, was probably planted in the building. Uh, so that's what we have been told by um, Albert Terry, who is the uh, chief of safety for the New York City Fire Department. He told me that just moments ago. And a CBS News chopper in the air over the towers reported the same thing. If Jim Smith is with us still in Chopper 2, Jimmy, you there? Just, uh, we saw some kind of explosion, a lot of smoke come out of the top of the tower, and then uh, it collapsed down onto the streets below, much like we saw the first tower just about a half hour ago. Chopper 2 as he takes these pictures. Jim? Yes, I, I am here, Michael. Oh, Jim, tell us, tell us what's happening out there. Oh, we just gosh. witnessed oh. some kind of secondary uh, follow-up explosion on the oh, World Trade Center, Center number 2, the one Secondary. We've all unfortunately seen the famous photos of victims jumping out of Tower 1 and 2. But that happened in the first 15 minutes while the jet fuel was still burning. Later, we have the photographs of the victims standing in the impact holes from the aircraft begging for help for 20 to 30 minutes. How could they survive heat that would melt through giant four-foot steel girders? The answer is they couldn't. And the firefighters are on record as saying the fires were almost out. The fact is, the temperatures had dropped dramatically. The fires were almost extinguished. The people were in the open wounds in the sides of the buildings begging for help. Help that did come in the form of the valiant firefighters who had the buildings blown up around them. The tape you're about to hear is from the grave. As a valiant firefighter reports that the fires were almost out, and as firefighters went public and said that the fires had almost been extinguished, the federal government ordered them under national security to stop talking to the public and told the media that all the firefighter tapes had malfunctioned, but not before firefighters had rebelled and released segments of tape, a segment you're about to hear. What do you got up there, Steve? I'm still in Boyce Fairway, 74th floor, no smoke or fire problem. The wall is a breach, so be careful. Yeah, 10-4, I saw that on 68. Bloody, come on over. Bloody, come on over by us. Hey, Ryder, folks, one five. We got two. I saw the pockets of fire. We should be able to knock it down with two lines. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? 78 floor. Numerous 1045 cold ones. What scare are you in, Mario? Seconds before the towers collapsed, blast points could be seen springing up down the sides of the buildings from the top down. Within days of 9-11, Bush and his minions began grandstanding at ground zero, telling us, give up your liberties and we'll protect you. Go along with our invasion of the world and everything will be okay. Then there were all the pre-9-11 warnings from the French, the British, the Egyptians, the Italians, the Russians, the Israelis, the Indians. The list goes on and on, but Condoleezza Rice and George Bush told us they'd never heard of such a plan of al cia to fly hijacked jets into the World Trade Center and Pentagon. It didn't matter if CNN had reported on it back in 1995. Even the Taliban, two months before 9-11, said, Stop Osama, he's about to attack you. What they didn't know is... He was working for Mr. Bush. I want to add that, you know, the president knew about a month in advance before the, we were attacked here in New York. He got the, me the memo. Yeah, he didn't do anything about it. And we all know that. Now he's here in New York in the convention and he's going to be applauded by, you know, thousands and thousands of people. This is ridiculous. Howard Dean recently seemed to muse aloud whether you had advanced knowledge of 9-11. Do you agree or disagree with the RNC that this kind of rhetoric borders on political hate speech? Yeah, uh, look, there's time for politics, and uh, you know, it's time for politics, and uh, I, uh, some sort of insinuation. In that case, sir, can I follow up on something unrelated? Uh, <laughs> Let's talk about motives. The Project for New American Century, founded back in 1996 by 25 neocons, Dick Cheney, Jeb Bush, Paul Wolfowitz, all of these people said 
on their own website, in publications. We need, quote, helpful Pearl Harbor events. I don't think Pearl Harbor was helpful, but we need a terrorist attack on the order of Pearl Harbor to get the American people behind a war. The globalists took a baseball bat, and we're a beehive. America's a beehive. You know, the uh, sleeping giant. And they took that baseball bat, and they went, ooh, terrorists got you. Bam! Hey, bees, the terrorists over there, go get our oil for us. And we all came out of the hive. And now we kind of settle back down, so they keep waving the back, going, well, I don't want to hurt our bees too bad, but we may have to whack them again to get them behind what we're doing. All right, Tara's going to get you. Tara's going to get you. Give up your rights to us. How many of you know that NORAD stood down for over an hour and 25 minutes, but if your Cessna gets off course for five minutes, they're going to launch F-16s on you. Remember Payne Stewart, the golfer? Fifteen minutes after his jet got off track, they had F-16s all around him. But on 9-11, in the most controlled airspace in the world, they could do nothing about four jets. But it gets worse. Guess why NORAD stood down? The average people in the military are good folks. They were told it was a drill. Because the Associated Press reported, and the CIA's own website admits, that on the morning of 9-11, the CIA was running a drill of flying hijacked jets into the World Trade Center and Pentagon. It was just a coincidence. At 8.30 in the morning, there was a drill of the exact same thing happening, and so NORAD stood down. Anybody know what problem, reaction, solution is? Create a crisis to scare the people into submission. They're begging for help, and you take their rights. Does anybody know what Hitler did? Right after he got elected, he firebombed his own Reichstag building. And then he said the communists did it. And they had a mass wave of arrest and took people's rights and set up Reich security or homeland security. The North American Aerospace Defense Command is charged with defending North America's airspace. On the morning of September 11, 2001, Vice President Dick Cheney was in control of NORAD. This was the first time in U.S. history that a president or vice president was in direct control of the military agency. NORAD was founded in 1957, and generals always had the power to shoot down or intercept hijacked aircraft. But on June 1st, 2001, just three months before 9-11, Dick Cheney ordered Donald Rumsfeld to allow him to take control of NORAD itself and the shoot-down procedure and remove that power from the generals so they could do nothing. Here is a copy of the memorandum from Rumsfeld to the Joint Chiefs telling them they no longer have any authority. An Associated Press article in August of 2002 reported that the CIA just so happened to be running a drill on the morning of 9-11 of flying jets in the World Trade Center and Pentagon. Then senior FAA officials ordered air traffic controllers to shred the tapes from 9-11 in violation of federal law. AP learned of the drills because at a Homeland Security function after 9-11, they bragged about it. Oh, we had foresight. We were running drills that very morning. Then USA Today reported that drills held weeks before 9-11 included targets that were the Pentagon and World Trade Center. Don't just look at me. Take the damn paper, read it, get informed. We were undefended on 9-11. They're still in power. They're sitting there eating filet mignon. People are losing their jobs every day. We've got a bullsh** war in Iraq. Who took responsibility for 9-11? Well, shouldn't we reward them for doing a bad job? I mean, that... Yeah, we should reward them... Bushes, we should thank him for the job he did. The way you re reward traitors is how we should reward. But he says he's done a great job. And, uh, I know what he says. I know what he did. Dick Cheney. He ran and hid in a hole in Nebraska. I get fired if I make a typo in a letter, okay? I get fired for that. Instead, we've still got Rumsfeld. We've got Condoleezza Rice. We've got Dick Cheney. We've got all the same criminals. They're criminals because they allowed this to happen. Four planes in two hours. How can that be? Only 14 planes guarding the entire East Coast. I say bullshit. Complete bullshit. We know this is the greatest country on earth. We have the biggest military on the planet. How can it be? Four planes in two hours. Do the math. One of the biggest holes in their argument is the fact that they never heard of a plan to fly hijacked jets into landmarks on the East Coast. We're going to take a closer look tonight at another example of where, despite the conventional wisdom, there were people in the United States who actually were preparing to defend against the kind of attacks which occurred here on 9-11. The North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD for short, 
has been defending the skies over the U.S. and Canada for almost 50 years, 46 to be precise. USA Today reports that in the two years before the attacks on September the 11th, NORAD conducted exercises using hijacked airliners as weapons. And one target was the World Trade Center. We knew he hated us. But there was uh, nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes in the buildings on such a massive scale. But that turns out not to be true. U.S. military planners did envision and practice those very scenarios. As reported by USA Today, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, conducted exercises with fighter jets, simulating hijacked planes flown into the World Trade Center in the two years before the attack. And so then I saw Condoleezza Rice get up on TV and say, we had never thought, we had never heard. Well, that's a ridiculous conspiracy theory to say that. Pentagon planners also envisioned the attack on the Pentagon five months before it happened. The Pentagon had a drill in November of 2000 simulating a hijacked jet being flown to the Pentagon. So between all the drills before 9-11 and the drill in the morning of 9-11, air traffic controllers thought that it was a simulation. Hijacked aircraft headed towards New York. Is this, is this real world or exercise? No, this is not an exercise manifest. And now respected rescue workers who worked the World Trade Center site say that they found three of the four data recorders and were ordered to load them on FBI vehicles and keep their mouths shut. Why would the feds want to cover up what was on those recorders? Thousands of years ago when a crime was committed in Rome, the judges would ask one question, qui bono, or who stands to gain, who profits? And when we look at 9-11, the answer is clear. Let's look at what the Bush family was doing in the days before 9-11 and on 9-11, and it's quite revealing. Marvin Bush was in New York City running security for the World Trade Center complex. Former President Bush was in D.C. at the Ritz-Carlton for a Carlisle Group function sitting at the head table with the head of the Bin Laden family. Two days before 9-11, Governor of Florida Jeb Bush declared unprecedented martial law in Florida. He didn't make the announcement until September 11th. Then we have the CIA-controlled head of Pakistani intelligence, General Ahmoud Ahmed, arriving in Washington, D.C. on September 13th, just days after he wired, the New York Times admits, $100,000 to the supposed lead hijacker, Mohammed Atta. For the week he was here, preceding 9-11, he met with CIA Director George Tenet, the heads of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees, Porter Goss and Senator Graham. By the way, Porter Goss has now been made head of the CIA. On the morning of 9-11, he was actually having breakfast with Senator Bob Graham and Porter Goss. What is the money man behind Muhammad Atta doing meeting with all the intelligence heads? In the days after 9-11, the public was told that we were going to be able to catch whoever was behind September 11th because they had engaged in record put options against American and United Airlines. But when the money trail led back to CIA-controlled companies, companies headed up by people like Buzzy Krongard, number three at the CIA, the story was dropped like a hot potato. But that doesn't stop Buzzy from still going public and defending people like Osama bin Laden. He told the Times of London and many other publications that we should just leave Osama bin Laden alone, let him go free, that we've got a problem if we want to capture him. Prominent people across the world have been exposing the 9-11 cover-up. Michael Meacher, the number three man in the Blair government, wrote a huge editorial for the London Guardian titled The War on Terror is Bogus. And he pointed out that NORAD stood down on 9-11. He wrote about the Project for a New American Century, run by Jeb Bush and Dick Cheney, years before 9-11, saying that they needed a helpful terrorist attack to get the American people behind their war for empire. Meacher concluded his article by saying, if the U.S. government didn't engineer the attacks, they certainly knew about it. Andres von Bülow was German defense minister and German technology minister. I interviewed him on my syndicated radio program, and he said there's no way al-Qaeda carried out these attacks. Only the military-industrial complex could pull it off. But here's one of the biggest pieces of evidence. You all heard them say that a paper passport fell out of one of the towers and was picked up by a police officer on the street. This plane flies into the building, explodes with jet fuel out of the guy's jacket, 
goes through the fireball, through the side of the plane, out of the burning building, out of the fire shooting out, and comes down to the ground unscathed. But something happened. For six months they reported they had this passport. Boy, we've got it. We've got the proof. And then the guy stood up and was alive in the Middle East, and they pulled it and said, oh, that was a mistake. He wasn't a hijacker, and the story just disappeared of the passport. Because believe me, this establishment could care less about you. The EPA found all the asbestos. The EPA, guys, said that there was asbestos and people were getting sick, and there was going to be $90 million for the police and firefighters for medical treatment. And Bush came in and had that block. Now that's mainstream news. And now of the 14 search and rescue dogs, eight of them have died from cancer. In summation, it's important to note that we only covered a tiny portion of the facts and evidence that clearly shows that 9-11 was an inside job. Number one, the official story of 9-11 has been completely disproven. At every point, we've caught them lying, manufacturing evidence, or covering up evidence. From high-level government inside sources and publicly available facts, we now have a very clear picture of how 9-11 was carried out. Number one, we know that the men who were on board the aircraft, who were supposedly the hijackers, had their houses, cars, credit cards paid for by the U.S. government. They were, in truth, agents taking part in drills and nothing more. Supposed computer malfunctions at American and United ensured that all four planes only had 20% occupancy on board. On a day when flights on the East Coast were an average of 80% full. Once the decoys, known as hijackers, were on board the planes, a gas was released, knocking out the occupants of the aircraft. Then a small criminal group in control of remote control systems patented for over 20 years took control of the aircraft and flew them into the World Trade Centers and Pentagon. The CIA controlled drills that morning confused NORAD for over an hour until it was almost too late for them to shoot down the hijacked planes. I said almost too late. When they did find out Dick Cheney wouldn't let the planes fly over 350 miles an hour so three of the aircraft were able to hit their targets. The fourth wasn't able to because our sources in the Pentagon have told us generals didn't follow their orders and had Flight 93 shot down. If it would have hit its target, the Capitol, the government would have been completely decapitated and the president could have declared total martial law. By the grace of God, everything didn't go as planned. And so now the globalists have spent the last three and a half years trying to cover up the sloppy job they did on 9-11. They're counting on the public, not being able to face the horror of what really took place so they can carry out another, even more devastating attack and finish the job they started, enslaving America and using the country as an engine to take over the planet. The only thing that can stop them now is the American people having the courage to face the truth about 9-11 and to expose it. If we don't, they're going to continue to use problem, reaction, solution. And it's going to be sad to watch the American people after the next attack going to the very killers that carried it out, begging them to protect them. And it's sad to see the deaths of these 2,800 plus people being used to sell a police state in America. You know, Bush says the terrorists attacked us, whoever the terrorists are, because they hate our freedom. Well, then why is the government, period, whether it's George Bush or John Kerry, trying to kill our freedoms? America is in America, and we don't have these God-given freedoms. That's why this country is loved. No, now we're being forged into a tool of global empire to be launched against sovereign, innocent nations that we know had nothing to do with 9-11. The Republicans are here and taking advantage of the 3,000 people that died right behind me for their own selfish politics, and it's very sad. I cried here for the first time today. I come here all the time. I've never cried here before. I, for some reason, I cried for the future because the way they're exploiting these dead people. Because in your guts, you know that the criminals are returning to the scene of the crime to gloat and to use the bloody sacrifice they committed. I couldn't have said it better myself. So now Bush is here in the Big Apple using the deaths as an attempt to get reelected. September 11th. September 11th, men armed with knives, armed with chemical, biological, or even nuclear weapons. The fanatics who terrorist killers, September 11th, terrorist Al Qaeda, terrorist Taliban, nuclear weapons, terrorist 9 11 terror. My fellow Americans, 
We have already been attacked. Terror. Terrorist. Evil. September 11th. In those days after the towers fell. September 11th. September 11th. Ground zero. And suddenly the streets were full of sirens and there was fire in the sky. Terrorism September 11th. Osama bin Laden declared war in America. September 11th. Terrorists. A walking, talking weapon of mass destruction. Barbaric terrorists. Terrorists for terrorism. September 11th. September 11th. The terrorists. War and danger. September 11th. September 11th. Terrorism. Global terrorism. The horror. Terrorism. Terrorists. Terrorist, 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 the terrorist. Terrorist, terrorist, terrorism. September 11th, global terrorism, terrorism. Terror, terrorism. September 11th, world terrorism, terrorism. Terrorism, 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 terrorist. September 11th. Threat of global terrorism, terrorism, terrorist, global terrorism, terrorism, terrorism. September 11, 2001, global terrorism. Terrorist, global terrorism, terrorism, terrorist. September 11, terror. Terrorism, the attack on our homeland. Back from the attack on our economy and back from the attack on our way of life. Terrorism, terrorists, hate. We must be fierce and relentless and terminate terrorism. Terrorists. You defeat them. It yearns to destroy not just the individual, but the entire international order. That's why America is safer with George W. Bush as president. September 11th, terrorism. September 11th. Terrorism, terrorists. September 11th. Hera, terrorists. Terrorist terror. September 11th. Threat. Tyranny. Terrorist tyranny. Tyranny. People hate us. Terror. Terrorism. September the 11th. Terror, 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 terror. Weapons of mass destruction. September the 11th. September the 11th. Terrorists, terrorists. The evil terrorists. Terrorists. The terrorists know. The terrorists know. The elite know we're restless, that we're catching on to their scam. That's why they're now using sound wave weapons that the military has used in Iraq on the streets of America. There's your LRAD, ladies and gentlemen, used against the Iraqis, used against the Palestinians, now used against us in America. We're getting reports that about this garden, they're already using them. Long before 9-11, they were getting the sound wave weapons, the microwave weapons ready, building all the emergency containment facilities. They knew all this was coming. How you doing, officer? Did you know I interviewed the CEO of this company a few years ago? Our boys are using these in Iraq, aren't they? Okay. Ask all the questions to uh, DCPI, Commissioner Paul Brown. I'm from Austin, Texas. Are those the guys in the white outfits? Right. Do you know what those are? What? Those are sound wave weapons they're using in Iraq. They can burst. Oh, it's because of the, uh, now they're out here. What do you think of it? I don't know anything about it. It might be necessary, but I doubt it. I think uh, everyone knows it's a peaceful protest. So. Yeah, I mean, well, the point is, is that these are things used in Iraq against enemies. And now it's being used right here in America. Now that the government in general considers the American people enemies of the state, defense contractors have a whole new lucrative market selling high-tech weapons normally sold to the military for the police. We're on our way to a protest that's unauthorized, not permitted. They've been arresting people by the thousands, and we're going to cover it. Of all the hundreds of huge protests we've seen, a small group broke off with an unpermitted march and is moving down towards Madison Square Garden, or MSG as New Yorkers call it. Now notice as we walk here that the roads have all been pinned conveniently ahead of the march. So tourists, anybody that's in here to be arrested, and we are now inside the pens. Now look at them hurting us. Look at, the, look at their cars. Hurting us. I wonder if it'll be like Monday night. I wonder if they'll run horses and mopeds into us. 11.35. 11.35. If you're here at 11.35, they will arrest you. But the, but, I'm sorry. They're hardly letting people out. They're opening up the pens a little inch to let people slowly trickle out. So they're sick. And now we're getting in trouble for letting y'all know. Well, that little story about how they're going to arrest people really worked. Look, everybody's leaving. Police then went in with barricades and broke the protest up into four different blocks and randomly arrested innocent people. It was the same story over and over and over again. And police brutality was completely out of control. Reporters for Reuters, the Associated Press, student reporters, tourists, even an American spectator reporter 
was arrested and taken to Pier 57. Look around you. A prison is being built. A high-tech cashless society control grid. We're now going to explore the ruling elite in the world today and what their driving ideology and philosophies are. We'll also look at their minions, the people that slavishly serve them. Well, here we are, all the way from Austin, Texas, covering a Republican National Convention. What we're seeing here is Skull and Bones Coronation Number 2. Well, down here you can see the CNN staff, Bush Light. Uh, they love the president, put out all the propaganda. They also worship Kerry. So does uh, Fox News when it comes to worshiping Bush. So here's the so-called mainstream media you can trust, which is nothing more than basically a CIA front to propagandize and manipulate the people. But it's all in a slick packaging with a great, impressive background, and that's what people respond to. You know what? I bet most of those so-called Texans down there from that Texas delegation aren't even first-generation Texans. They're just as phony as George W. Bush is. A guy who is from Kenny Buckport, Maine, whose daddy speaks with a perfect Atlantic accent. People who were Tories back in the Revolutionary War, they came down carpet bag into Texas when, when George was a little boy. And now so many Texans and phony Texans have been sucked in by this and just love the whole motif. But again, it's form over substance. It's the packaging. Yeah, I'm a slave. I'm happy about it. I'm, I'm proud of it. I've decided to just join the New World Order. I've decided to just go along with it and have a good time. The media has really been covering Skull and Bones lately, how Bush and Kerry are both members. Are you aware of that organization? I am not. Does it concern you that they both were in the same uh, fraternity in college and just two years apart? Uh, no, it does not. Just one hell of a coincidence that uh, 15 members each year out of 290 million people and the two presidential candidates are Skull and Bones. I would say that's a coincidence. I would say that's a coincidence.